what in fact are you doing over here? Why are you here? <laughs> I wish I knew, really. And I feel I, I've come here to do something now. And I feel I've come here for some reason, and I've got to find some reason before I can go back again. I've got sort of conscience about it. It seems ridiculous now. What are they doing here? It's a long way from the King's Road to Kathmandu. The authorities here dislike and distrust the hippies. To their embassies, they can be an embarrassment, sometimes a nuisance. The hippie trail can be adventurous and romantic, but it can be ugly and destructive. It can end in disease, repatriation, and even death. <laughs> The trail begins in the bohemian quarters of big cities, London's King's Road, New York's Greenwich Village, Toronto's Market Street. It winds through Istanbul, Tehran and Korbel, empties out into the romantic subcontinent of Asia. The Ganges to the Hindus a holy river imbued with mystic qualities and religious significance. To the hippies a cheap place to stay with houseboats costing only a few pennies a night to hire. To have 50 pounds here is to be rich. It's more than most Indians can earn in a year. The hippie trail can be a cheap version of a cook's tour. To the hippies, as to the tourists, Benares is no more than a place in the sun with palaces and picturesque squalor. But for many, the hippie trail is more than just a journey. It's an idea. It can be an adventure, an experiment in communal living, an emotional experience. It can be escapist into a nomadic society of their own with no inhibitions about sex or drugs. It can be a gesture of revolt against parents, against what critics like to call bourgeois materialism. It can be a search for new ideals. Chris and Fiona were both at Oxford where he studied Sanskrit and she fine arts. Chris is Polish, Fiona Scottish from a comfortable middle class home in Edinburgh. Both are convinced of the value of their particular trip. <coughs> it's a question of, if you like, a point of view. If you want, if you want to look at something objectively, then you have to dissociate from yourself from it for a while in order to. If you want to have a look at yourself, then you have to strip yourself of your um, all, all the sort of facades that you wear with yourself and play to other people. If you want to have a look at society, the best place to do it, to do it from is to bury yourself somewhere either away or go plunge into yourself into a completely different environment. And, and get get a slightly more objective approach because as long as you're in a particular system, you're you're involved in that particular system and you cannot see it because because you're seeing it through the eyes of the particular system that you're considering. Do you in fact think there's any use for the objectivity you acquire through being aware, or isn't this part of what it's about? Use? How do you mean use? Well, it's all experience. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one. Most people don't know anything about India at all. They have no conception of what it's like. One can't necessarily get too much out of it without knowing the language and living the life of an Indian, which is very difficult for any white person to do for a start. But 
one can gain a little more knowledge, one can see a different kind of culture which isn't developed. I mean, one of the things I like about India is the fact that it's still natural. People have a natural rhythm of living, that they're not living in Tom Academ neon lit streets where they don't see the spring in well, every in year. Medieval Europe. Well, this is still the Middle Ages in many, many respects, and I'm very glad of it. I, I wish that, you know, go and throw your motor cars away. They're hideous. <laughs> On the other hand, poor old donkeys. <laughs> On the other hand, you're in a very privileged position. Do you ever feel that you're in a very privileged position, yeah. just being able to observe? Oh, yeah. It is a very privileged position because it's sort of, it's almost a fascist position, if you like, because um, one is, one is basically scooping the fruits, as it were. But, but I feel this is only justified if you, if you have some sort of an objective, if you're doing something, um, you know, developing your interests or furthering your knowledge. Otherwise, then you just sort of lie there in the sun and you have a good time, but it, doesn't, it's, it is not entirely satisfactory. What do you find particularly satisfactory about being able to sit on a boat in the Ganges, observing a very poor country? Well, I, this is not the reason why I'm sitting on a boat on the Ganges. I'm not really observing a poor country. I'm, I, I sort of, this is a place to live as, as, as any other place for me. Uh, I, could, I could do the same thing in Nepal or in London. I'm interested in it. In, 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 in what I'm interested in, I've, I've got my books with me, and I'm quite happy with them. And uh, this just happens to be a very nice environment, much more pleasant than, say, say living uh, in the middle of London. But you can enjoy one, you can enjoy the other. When you say poor country like that, you imply that sort of this is pain and misery. I mean, I don't think these people are any less happy than the average businessman in London. They just have a different way of living. And, and I think that it's physically harder and they're very poor, but they have a great deal of richness and happiness that the businessman in London doesn't have. I think one tends to underrate the businessman and, and one tends to classify things into labels, you know, businessman, Indian and all these things. And, and they're just sort of... <laughs> Well, modes of thinking which which you have been conditioned to. What do you think society thinks of you? Well, I don't know, but so, sort of... <laughs> I think they're jealous, actually. <laughs> they probably think of layabouts. And we, you know, life must be pain and toil. Speaking Why are yourself. these people sitting on houseboats enjoying themselves when the dobies are sweating it out in the Ganges? And I mean, that's true now. But then surely there's some sort of choice in the matter. Does it worry you that people should consider you to be low about? It doesn't worry me. Well, it worries me because I've always sort of... I've had a I'm Protestant background that's always, you know, given me <laughs> a heavy guilt feeling about everything I do. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> You've been I, reading too much Freud. <laughs> no, I, I justify it all by saying, oh, well, one day I'll go back and be a, an upright citizen. Whether I can <laughs> now, I don't know. What a sellout. <laughs> It used to be the height of hippie fashion to visit the Buddhist temples of Nepal, to see the mystical city of Kathmandu lying in a valley among the foothills of the Himalayas, within sight of Annapurna, Kanchenjunga and Everest. They do say here in Nepal, if you weep, a hundred weep with you. If you smile, a thousand smile with you.
There are as many reasons for travelling as there are travellers. This is the third time Maurice has climbed from the plains of India into the little mountain kingdom of Nepal, following the trail without being a part of it. For him, the Hippie Trail is a modern version of the 19th century Grand Tour, an adventure, a chance to see and be part of other people's worlds. Maurice is Belgian, calls himself a traveller because to him, hippie is a dirty word describing dirty people who are spoiling the trail for genuine travellers like himself. He is almost a pilgrim to the shrines of an ancient and foreign culture. <laughs> The Monkey Temple of Kathmandu is a refuge for monks who fled from Tibet after the Chinese invasion. Now they are invaded more peaceably. Oh, yes. monk. Yeah. You don't know where he is? Yes, I have. Uh, no, no, the rank monk. Fat one. Yeah. Mm. Oh, the uh, fat monk. It's not here? I, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> Well, I'll have a look on. Maurice smokes pot, it's legal in most Himalayan countries, and uses some of the hippie language. The monks in their cells may not understand when he says bread, he means money. When he says potatoes, it means potatoes. But in any language, barter is barter. In the sparse life of a monk, venerable rings and bracelets are of less value than a blanket or a plastic water bottle. Mm -hmm. ah! Maurice is an artist, a sculptor successful enough in Belgium to have earned the money to start on the trail. Well, I got two exhibitions in Belgium before I left. And uh, I sold some work. This was my start money. Yeah. And I uh, got a car, bought me a car in Germany, and drove it down. Sold it. This was more, more money for traveling than in, uh, in Bangkok I work. You know, and this got me the money for my, my month's stay in Bangkok. Then in Australia, I was three months in the bush, and I can tell you it was hard work, man. It's very hard work, but it was worth it, because you say you work three months, you got a lot of money to travel again for a year. You're talking about, you mentioned the, the two different sorts of people who travel. What are the two different sorts of people? Well, free coats, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you see it. It's not because you're wearing blue jeans and a sweater or a shirt. And it's, I think it's, it's a big difference. You're running around like fools, talking about Buddhism, and you don't even know anything about it. You just arrived here in, in, in Kathmandu for two weeks, and you had the nerve to go in in a llama, in the place where a head llama is, without knocking of her, out asking, and just come up and ask potatoes, because you got no bread to buy in potatoes. So tell me, can you do in England or Belgium or France, go just walk into a garden or his palace and ask for potatoes? So what for the hell? You don't res if they come to here, they have to respect the religion, they have to respect the peoples, but not hanging around like fools and just roam the place, you know? Yeah. I'm smoking on myself, you know? Yeah. I'm not just uh, making... Uh, give them a bad time about the smoking because I'm smoking on myself. But just the way they're acting around here. Do you miss anything at all about Belgium? No. Actually? No. No, because of my three years traveling, I got more of my friends than I ever got with someone in Belgium. Because they are true friends. Maurice and his Canadian girlfriend, Jerry, are on their way round the world for the third time. They've been to every continent, to most countries. Now they think maybe they'll stop soon, settle and even marry. 
except when Maurice has been working to earn money for the next stage of the journey, they've been together since they first met on the trail three years ago. Where did you actually meet Maurice? In Austria, in 1967. How? I was staying in a youth hostel. By accident. <laughs> <laughs> and we were getting ready to leave one morning, and Morris and two other fellows were um, looking for passengers to Istanbul, and they asked us would we like to go, which we did, and we kept going east from there. Yeah. But what's the, what's sort of the attraction of travelling. I think for most people it would be their idea of really hell on earth to be permanently on the move, permanently living in small, fairly cheap rooms, having to carry all your goods and chattels with you all the time. What's attractive about it? It's not attractive when you look at it that way, but <laughs> when you're in one place, you, you feel after a while that you're in a, a rut and someone come by, comes by, um, a friend, or and they've just come from Japan or Australia and you feel that oh you'd like to go rather than just going to work every day Coming home doing the same things all the time Yeah, but you cannot travel for the rest of your life, you know, and I think When you're already very lucky and I come traveling for three years and I've been in all these countries and I have seen What's probably up a million people's Probably only two or three have a chance. Because when you reckon out the, the population of the world, you know, and it's like in the mountains up there, the people haven't seen a car or, or a bike. You haven't seen it. So just imagine you want these peoples. And what you have, yeah, I feel myself. The richest man. The mysticism of Eastern religions has always been a lure to the adventurous and the romantic. Maurice and Jerry's friends, Sonam and Addison, aren't interested in drugs and despise those who are. Addison teaches English one day a week in a school in Kathmandu. Sonam is on holiday from her guru in Benares. They're students of Tibet, Buddhism, perhaps even themselves. To them, the trail is a pursuit in search of awareness and self-knowledge. To Addison, a search that had a strange, almost improbable beginning. Anderson, can I ask you, what, what first inspired an interest in the Eastern Union? You'd have to go back to my childhood, you know. I think, what was the name of, of uh, the book we were just looking at? <laughs> jungle Book. Yeah, The Jungle Book, probably Kipling. that. Kipling. Kipling was the first thing that, uh, my first memories of... Uh, thinking about India. There is obviously something about Nepal for you, and I think there is an atmosphere which one becomes aware of, but can you define at all what this atmosphere is and why it should be here rather than anywhere else? Well, one, maybe even a minor thing about it, but one thing that's, that I think is true, the 20th century hasn't come here yet, and the 19th hasn't come here yet. It's, uh, it's an ancient place. How easy do you find it, in fact, to get to talk to a llama here? Very, very easy. Just go and talk to one. Yeah. 
Even if you don't speak their language, you know? What happens if you don't speak the language? Then you just sit there and smile at each other yeah. and, and uh, feel the beautiful vibrations that come from, yeah, it doesn't from him. Matter. It doesn't matter. There's usually, you know, some, someone who does know, who does know some English. But uh, I don't know, there, there's more, more than what is spoken, you know, more than words. It's like, um, like sometimes when you meet like a very high lama, and you go several times, you know, and at first you think he's just very nice, you know? And then after a while you notice, you know? Like you meet a lot of good people, you know? And like a lot of people can be very, very kind and very good and very calm and very even-tempered, you know? Like a friend of mine was saying, you know, like you can sit in your room and you can feel full of compassion for everyone in the whole world, you know, and really feeling good. And then somebody enters the room and it's all gone, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've met a lot of people who are very, very kind, but something happens, you know? There's a point where their patience goes, there's a point where they get angry or where they get nervous or they think someone is not, you know, like paying them what the due respect they should have or someone, you know? Like, we're all like that, you know? And, um, and, but like when when you meet someone like a lama who is very high, you notice that uh, it's always he's always on that level. It doesn't let up. You you realize that he's never spoken any unkind word. That he's um, always calm. You go like with all sorts of questions and all sorts of frustrations, you know, and uh, problems and things like this. And you go in his room and he smiles and they're just all gone. They're all absorbed into his calm, you know. What do your parents and friends think of your spending this quite long time out here in the East? My father said he'd like to be doing it. <laughs> he said, great, you know, I could never do any traveling, you know, but I've always wanted to. And he said, just write to me, just write me letters and let me know what you see and what's happening. My father recently wrote me a letter and said, Addison, it's a long way from Georgia to, Nip to Nepal, and uh, frankly, I just don't know what's happening there. And so that's, that's what he thinks. A long way from it's Georgia. A, yeah, it's a long way from Georgia. Does he approve or not? Uh, well, he's a businessman, you know. And uh, since I have chosen not to be a businessman, he can't completely approve of it. But uh, I'm of age now, and so uh, whatever I do is all right with him, I think. Does he ever ask you what good all this contemplation is going to do you and what you're going to get out of it? No, he doesn't ask me that. Never. Has, has he ever asked you what you might do with it? Well, that sounds like a question he might ask, but he hasn't. <laughs> what would you tell him if he did? Be happy, I think. That's probably what I'd say. It's not difficult to be happy in Nepal. Even the squalor of a shilling-a-night doss house is picturesque. And to the visitor, the rhythm of life is leisurely, almost timeless. There's no industry, no soot, no smoke. There are no traffic jams, no rush hour, no rat race, and it's cheap. It costs only two and six a week to rent a hut cheap enough even if there is no water, electricity or sanitation. And yet still there are many who try to find a shortcut to Nirvana with drugs. Not for them a Buddhist temple and 20 years of meditation. Their trip is shorter to the bakery and the dropout guru, Trevor. It used to be a working bakery, now it's disused. The hippies talk of restarting it, of earning their living here. They talk a lot, but they do little.
these. The bakery is a hippie commune, picturesque and unhygienic. Every stranger is welcome. If he can find a space on the floor for his sleeping bag and rug, he can stay. Those who live here pay if they can, don't if they can't. When we were there, they couldn't, and the electricity was cut off. There's nothing to do, nothing expected, except to make music. Nobody expects you to make sense. What happened? What well, what happened was that when I formed my mind into the torus and sucked the Earth's magnetic flux through myself, it amplified all my brain waves. And how could that be tested from the outside? What kind oh, of way, I think what they kind of tested it. They? I think if they had their trips together, they could have had the right instruments laying around. But if they, I don't know, you know, I don't know who's running this scene, who, who they're throwing out in the pall, who they're letting in with what bugs. Oh, it's the immigration people. Yeah, the immigration make everybody paranoid. Why did they do that? I went down there and I was on a hate trip all day. This guy did nothing but insult me. And I smiled for half an hour until finally I said, he said, uh, you just come here to loaf. And I said, I wish, I wish that I could sit in office all day and write things. I wish that I could be so lucky. A good health why do you, why do you want me to do that? Why do you want me to do that? I don't you know. I, that's why I don't come back here. It's because every time I come here, you just sit around and insult me. Uh, don't be surprised when I don't come back. In fact, they won't be allowed back. The authorities have now closed their borders to the hippies. Nepal has problems enough without having also to cope with the hippies' problems of poverty, disease and drugs. And yet it does all have a slightly unnerving charm. Dave used to be a chemist, now he dabbles in astrology. His mind influenced by LSD, he tosses coins to find, from the way they fall, references in an ancient Chinese book on astrology. According to him, in his present condition, it takes up where modern science leaves off. You know, everything that's come into my possession has just got an outrageous quantity of plugs, symbolisms, and... Um, other, um, you know. Well, what do you deduce from the way they were falling? Um, I get what I want. Well, how do you get the references to your book? Well, I just happened to know that hexagram because I was doing a demonstration and um, I was throwing what I wanted to throw, you know. But we'll have to read the change because that's more complex. You see, I haven't read this book. <laughs> I just use it. Two here, send us this up here. Mm -hmm. And B7, this one. It may all seem no more than escapist, but I suppose it does take some sort of courage to start on the trail, particularly if, like Bill, you have to try and support a wife and child at home. He is a town planner and worked in Tehran and New York on major urban renewal projects before going east. When I was in the States, I worked all the time. I was a nut. I really like working, you know, I really love my work. Uh, but I found that if I do it for too long, I get, you know, bogged down and I can't think that clearly so. I'm certainly planning to take more uh, extended travels, you know, of this sort um, throughout my life. Uh, and I just wouldn't give it up, man. It's, it's reconstituting, you know, very uh, invigorating. Did you find it a difficult decision to make to give up a safe and creative and responsible job and just pack your bags and go? 
Yeah, well, I was going to another job, you see. That got me over here. Uh, do you mean when I left Durant? Mm. Yeah, that, it was hard. But it was hard just cutting myself free from all that, you know, all those responsibilities and uh, finishing, you know, how many things you have to do to leave a place if you're not coming back. Mm. And, uh, but psychologically, I didn't, you know. Um, it's like, uh, I think for us it's, you know, you turn the channel on the television. You're in Nepal, you know. It's, uh, that's nice, you know. Tehran had nice things about it. This has different nice things. You know, I don't want a city to own me or me to own a city or a place or, you know, it's like a woman too. I think same kind of attitude. I can't think of any women who would like being compared to a city. <laughs> no, I mean people and and places. You like to keep your friends. That's true. But if you get, I think if you get too hung up in uh, in something that's so uh, narrow yeah. that doesn't permit you to see other things, like one place or just one person or something like that, unless you're an extremely compatible. Uh, position with this person or this thing mm. that uh, you um, things just change you know and then they're not what they used to be and then people are, are sad because they aren't and uh, you know that brings a lot of sorrow and stuff Whereas if you if you just go and you know there's so much to to love and see and uh, feel and taste you know so you get stuck trying to get something more out of something that's not going to give it, whether it's a place or a person. It, it's very possessive. I think it's very um, insecure way of behaving. Do you think you'll go back to the States? <coughs> to yeah. live, work, and settle? Well, I don't think I'm ever going to be settled again, you know? I, I, uh, you know, I might spend five years someplace or ten years someplace, twenty, but... Um, even 20 years, but I, I won't think of it as being settled. I mean, this is our world. You know, we can all go wherever we want, more or less. Delhi, on the roof of a hotel in the old quarter of the city, what most people think of as more typical hippies, the flotsam of the hippie trail, the drug addicts. In India, pot is illegal, but hard drugs can be bought over the counter of any corner chemist's shop. These hippies will tell you that drugs are a step towards mysticism. What they don't tell you is that they are often a first step to addiction, infections like hepatitis, and even death. In Delhi, the hippies are an irritation to the government, an affront and an embarrassment to their own embassies, and a constant gnawing worry to the parents at home of the younger ones. Victoria is only 18. She left school 18 months ago with three A-levels, nine O-levels, and a year to wait before university. Hippiedom became part of her life when she was doing a summer art course in Rome a year ago. Almost inevitably, she joined the trail. It was school, really, and I don't know, I was at boarding school for three years, and I felt everything was too comfortable. Well, not boarding school, that was hell, but, but everything, everything, my home and everything, I got everything. It was too much. And I wanted to see places. I wanted to make up for myself. I didn't want to have to, I didn't want anybody to sort of guide me or help me in any way. I wanted to be helpless, really to be out of reach of anyone's help. And I've been in that situation since, and it's really terrifying. Uh, but I know what it is now, I know, I, and I think I know what to do about it now, if I get in this again. 
Well, I'm in it now already. I mean. Why are you in it now? Well, you're in a place and, and no one particularly knows where you are. And your, your embassy aren't, aren't very concerned about you because, as far as they're concerned, you're a damn nuisance. You're letting down the, the opinion, the um, public opinion of the country. And, and you come to the embassy sort of penniless and are asked to be um, repatriated or something when you've finally given up all hope. Or perhaps they get a wire from some, some hotel they'd never heard of saying you're sick and you've been sent to hospital, what are they going to do about it? And you're just a constant problem for them in those terms. Or maybe they've never heard of you before, but all your friends are a problem to them. So they're not going to be very sympathetic. And your home is so far away. It's just very far away. Not just in a matter of, of time and, and space, but just a sort of um, the wavelength, the vibrations. Everything, that, that's, everything's so different. You're, you're such a long way away in, in sort of conceptual terms. You're just too far away. What do you think your parents' reaction would be if they knew you were here in this room on the top of this rather bleak hotel in a rather bleak part of Delhi? I don't know. My mother would be horrified, probably. And my father... My, fa my father would be horrified too, but he'd say, um, well, look, she, she's got herself into her, the situation. She ought to be able to get herself out of it. Because, and I think he, I, I, always, I always prefer my father's attitude because um, that way I feel I'm doing something for myself. And my mother, I know that if I'm in trouble, she'll come running. And she writes me letters and says, if you're sick, you know, I'll come on the first aeroplane. And I know that she would. And it frightens me, really, because I, I, I don't want the responsibility of this, the responsibility of this feeling that, that if I was sick, she would come on the next airplane, even if it meant sort of, you know, spending, I don't know, however much. When did you first start taking drugs? When I smoked hash um, while I was still in England. A friend gave it to me when I went down to London to see hair Christmas. I was just 16, I think. Yeah, and I, I smoked it about three other times before I left England. But I was never really stoned. I, I never even knew what drugs were before I left England. It, it was something pretty new to me. And it all sort of came gradually. And then I... I, I Ever since I got to Istanbul, really, I've been smoking pretty... Well, smoking every day, in fact. You, you get smoking, smoking hash. You, very often people have more, more hash about than cigarettes. And it's, it's a sort of big problem finding a cigarette to get enough tobacco to mix with the hash. And so you're smoking it all the time. You don't think of it as a drug. It's just something... It's part of your life. How important is sex in the whole of this sort of heavy scene? Is it part of the scene? Yeah, certainly, but I think more is companionship than anything else, quite honestly. Because certainly people who are fixing just aren't interested particularly. And it's good to have someone to travel with, it's good to have someone to be with, and that, that's where sex comes in. And, so, and sometimes, occasionally you meet people who, you know, a guy and a girl who are traveling around, and maybe they're married or maybe they're not, but they have a two-year-old child who's born somewhere in India or something. And that's nice, and, and they're people who've stuck together, and you really feel they, they've sort of got somewhere, and they've made something of, of whatever they were trying to do. But, but most times people sort of manage to stick each other for about four months and then drift apart. Some people might say, I think, that you are possibly doing yourself a lot of harm. Do you think you are? I don't know. I can't tell till I get back to England, quite honestly. But I don't think so, really, because I think you, there's the experience. And it is an experience. It's something that, that you'll never forget. And. I'm interested in writing. Maybe it'll give me some ideas. I write poetry, but 
you know, it, it takes time to come. And it gives me time to think. I needed time to think after, after A-levels in school. But I'm not sure if I, I've used the time in the right way because coming to the East and living in a very freaky place and taking a lot of very strange drugs is perhaps not a very good way to think things out. I think a lot of people at home might agree with you. Yes, they probably would. Probably my parents, certainly. But you have to choose your own way. You can't know if it's going to be right when you choose it. And you can't go back on it once you, you've chosen, you've chosen. That's it. Do you think you will look back on this time in years to come as being the substance of a dream or a nightmare? Oh, in terms. I'll probably remember the dream sequences, but I should say 75% of it's nightmare. A few months after we got back to London, we heard that Victoria had finally given up her search for even she knew not what, and had accepted an air ticket from her mother and come home too. She was desperately ill, in need of medical and psychiatric help, disillusioned with what she'd found at the end of the hippie trail. She's already spent weeks in a clinic and still needs much more treatment. There's certainly no lack of solid substance and material comfort in her family background, and although there's also no lack of love or concern for Victoria, her parents feel powerless to cope with the effects of hippie life on their daughter, brought up so differently themselves as they were. It was lucky. I mean, one, one, I think because we all had our... Those of us who grew up there, and we all had our ideals put before us on a plate. And we knew which way we were going. because Perhaps we accepted the way we were going, but it, it was a question that the job had to be done. And, of course, one had... I mean, one learned very early that one got to have the downs in life to appreciate the ups. But um, I then went to university, and, and perhaps the only time I ever was myself was when I was at university. After that, I got married and started looking after my own family. But now I've become somebody's mother, not just that, their wife. Now I'm known as, as Vicky's mother. There's, it's come the full circle. My individuality is still lost. <laughs> you both obviously care for Victoria. How did you react when she first told you that she was going to join the hippie trail and go to India? Shock, I should have said, initially. And uh, um, the anxiety is what, what steps you should take. I mean, there are the alternatives. One could, if one had uh, taken uh, certain steps, I think, have um, got her back at that stage, uh, which would have then been thoroughly against her will, I think, and uh, would not have uh, led to good relations with the future, certainly. Um, and we certainly considered taking that course and decided not to. Uh, In practical terms, what could you have done? Um, well, I think one could have got in touch with embassies and so on. One could have gone out there. One could, I feel confident, one could have um, found out where she was and, and um, met her, her and, okay. and uh, if not, brought her back. But I don't think it would have been the right thing to do. It's very difficult to, very difficult to decide. I think we really only thought this for 24 hours, didn't we? We thought one could, one can, of course, stop, stop them at the front and that sort of thing. But it was only certainly not longer than 24 hours that we thought this you know, was, was the right thing to do. Mm. And then what did you think? Well, then one just prayed and hoped that she would be strong enough to survive any um, snags and difficulties and hazards and dangers that she would encounter. Did you feel, uh, as her parents, that she was equipped herself to be able to cope with this sort of situation? No, she was too young, too young, definitely. I mean, if it had been uh, a few years la later, in her twenties, um, then one would have been uh, more confident, but I think... Uh, we would have given her every blessing, yes, absolutely every blessing, yes. had she been a little older. Mm. But being um, 
there she probably wouldn't like us to say this, I think they're mature in some ways, but astonishingly immature in others. One knew perfectly well that she would have a very rough road to her. And inevitably, one longs to protect one's children. I think this is the thing that was the feeling that one didn't want her to be hurt and didn't know how to stop it, that was probably uppermost in one's mind. What effect do you think, in fact, that Vicky's having been aware has had on her relationship with you and your relationship with her? And of course, it really one's got to start to get to know her again, I think. She's been away for a year and she's had experiences which probably, if I lived to be 150, I wouldn't have. And as shared experiences make for friendship, one hasn't got quite so much in common as one had before. But we were so absolutely thrilled to see her back. And we hope that in time she'll want to come home and be at home. And well, she yes, I which, think which, that's appeared already. Then. Which I think it really yes, it has appeared. She had, I mean, she does. But of course, her friend, she, she, she's still got to take up with all her own old friends again. And actually, probably, she's still, she's clinging to the friends she's made in her travels. If any friends of yours, aged 17, 18, 19 now, said they were going to do what you've done, or talking about doing what you've done, would you encourage them or discourage them from going? I think I'd encourage them. Why? Because I, I think there's so many things that, that you can't see from if, you, if you're always looking at things from one particular standpoint. But going back to the changing bit, I, I don't feel I've changed very much. I feel, I feel much older in a way and sort of sadder. <laughs> but I don't feel I, I've sort of changed basically. But uh, as my mother said, I, I think it, it's very difficult to say at this stage whether I've changed. Why do you feel sadder? Well, I, I feel I, I've sort of dispelled rather a lot of dreams. <laughs> well, I'm very sad that she should be sad. She's always been a fairly sad person for the last three or four years, anyhow. And I think it's part of life. When you're very young, perhaps you do look on life slightly more pessimistic. Some people look on life more, with a more pessimistic outlook than others. And they eventually come to terms and realize that, in fact, there's a great deal of hope and goodness and encouraging signs on all sides. But it takes time, perhaps, before one is aware of this. I think uh, a great many youthful dreams are bound to be shattered, but uh, um, there's still room, as you were saying, for a good many other um, ideals and so on to, to take their place. I think uh, I, I can sympathise with Vicky very much, because I'm basically a tremendous idealist myself. And being, luckily, married to an optimist, perhaps life is more hopeful for me than for, for others. But of course I'm sad that she, that she, sh she is sad because, um, as I said earlier, it, it's a shattering experience. It's a sort of form of torture to have one's children hurt. And this is the thing that I've hated most about the whole business and the whole journey. Oh, no.